I'm Tom Kennedy and welcome to Uncensored Stories. Today we're welcomed by one of my good friends, Jay Kennedy Harris. Thanks for joining us, Jay. Why don't we start off by you telling us a bit about your story, where you grew up, uh, your family, etc. Uh, yeah, uh, I like, kind of like telling my story because it's a bit of an interesting one. So um, I grew up in Endeavour Hills, which is just in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, I was born to, my mum was from Melbourne. She was also Indigenous and my dad was from far north Queensland um, and also Indigenous. So um, I grew up there. I actually grew up without dad for most of my childhood and sort of passed away quite young. Um, and I was there for quite a while until I sort of got to about year nine, so mid high school, then moved up as a boarder to Trinity Grammar, um, which was really good for me. Uh, it was a good sort of step out of the outer suburbs and probably helped set up a lot of my life there. Um, then moved on to Melbourne Uni for a year or so as a boarder there um, at one of the colleges. Um, and then after that, I actually played a lot of footy growing up and that was probably you know, a big portion of my career after school is I played in the AFL for six years. Um, and now my first year out of the, the league, I'm working for a building company. So been in a few different places and a few different things. Um, so, yeah. So uh, what was life like in, in Endeavour Hills when you were younger? What was it like growing up around there? What was the culture sort of like? The culture, yeah, it was, when I was there and growing up, I thought it, I thought it was quite cool. Um, we lived in a sort of nice little spot, sort of backed onto but at the end of a court, it backed onto a golf course. It was kind of quiet, a bit really nice. Um, Mum was pretty strict, so I had, had a pretty good upbringing. Um, the culture at the time, I probably didn't realise it was that bad, but like it's quite close to Dandenong, and Dandenong obviously has a lot of a gang culture, and that sort of filters out to the suburbs around it. So when I sort of started getting to my early teenage years, I started seeing the that. Um, but early childhood and where I spent the majority of my time was pretty good um, upbringing. Okay. And how, how old were you when your father passed away? So that would have been, I was 13 at the time. I'd sort of just, uh, I just started high school uh, in New Zealand. So yeah, there's a bit of a, I hadn't grown up with dad. So he, he went back to Cairns when I was two, um, which was a huge, I think living in Melbourne was a real, cultural shock for him that he never really adapted to and I was probably never really old enough to fully understand it um but yeah it was just I, that's how I grew up it's sort of the norm for me so it's almost like it's hard to say you missed out on something if you don't know what it's like it's not quite like a different um yeah so when I was 13 I passed away from cancer okay I'm so sorry to hear that mate um do you think that put a sort of pressure on you to sort of be the man of the house or to look after yourself to some, to some extent from a young age? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, um, mum, like people used to literally say, like mum used to always say you're the man of the house. It was just, it was my, myself, um, my mum and my sister. So quite literally I was the only male in the house. Um, yeah. And so it did come with that expectation and it's hard, like you're supposed to become a man or know what it's like to be the man of the house not really have a role model in front of you to emulate not quite like you know if you had like i said if you have your dad around for a long time you sort of see how it's how it might go around and then you sort of emulate that there's a lot of time yep. reacting yourself yep okay let's talk about um the indigenous community in australia and can you describe what you think the relationship between white australia and aboriginal australia looks like at the moment and how that relationship has changed if it has changed over your life yeah well it's yeah it's hard to speak as a whole because it's so multifaceted you can you know the i think the stereotype everyone always thinks of is um you know, like out back alice far north ter um, far north territory far north queensland those sort of places um when in reality like the majority of indigenous people all live in urban communities you know Redfern's quite famous in, up in Sydney. There's a huge Aboriginal community in Victoria. Um, and where it's at, it's, it's probably there's a lot of change that's come. But at the end of the day, because we started so segregated, there is still a lot of segregation. 
Um, and it's almost been, it's hard to break that because the, when you start off with that segregation and then you're trying to bring it back together, there's a lot of systematic issues that force that segregation to stay that way. So as much as like we keep trying to bring it together, there's a lot of things you know, that are sort of out of our power or can't be changed immediately to fix that. So what, what are some of those systematic um, factors? Um, I remember someone explaining to me once that if one of the first things that sort of segregated it was obviously a bit of like just blatant racism. Um, yeah. Uh, missions, uh, which were just all Aboriginal communities to keep them away from you know, the local town or the major cities. And then um, because, of, because of that, and then women in class citizens and then, uh, the bigger one is actually financial. So if you were to take, it's like a, you know, you've got a family who starts off like a white family and they have a, what we call generational wealth. So say you do really well for your family, build up a bit of wealth, helps them to get kick-started. So long we haven't had been treated or respected like that. So we almost worked like slaves. You know? yep. um, try and catch up with society. It's sort of stuck a long way back. And then how that stems to today is like, I look at the lack of access to really good healthcare or um, really good education. And it's hard to start creating that sort of wealth to give yourself opportunities because wealth does create opportunities in a lot of cases. Yep. So you're saying that the Aboriginal community wasn't even uh, classed as, as citizens to some extent, like how does that make you and other indigenous people feel that like in your own country, you're not even you weren't even classed as, as citizens. Yeah. So that's, I think that's probably the craziest part about where we're at today. So there's obviously our generation and we look at that and we're like, that's like the humanity that anyone possibly think about that another human being classed as, as a human being, like they were classed as part of the, well, we were classed as part of the Flora and Fauna Act. Um, but that same generation that was classed as the Flora and Fauna Act, they, they were still like, like they're still alive today. So, so can you just talk, talk on the uh, Flora and Fauna Act? Um, so, yeah, you classify everyone. So, obviously, you have your, your citizens. Um, and with your citizens, you get all your civil rights, your right to vote, um, and all that that comes with it. And the Flora and Fauna Act, which is obviously just your plants and animals, that's where yeah. we were classed for a really, really long time. I can't think of the exact date, but I think it was only maybe late 60s. Yeah. It's um, hard to believe, really. Um, what are some of the per specific personal struggles that, that you faced because of the colour of your skin growing up or as an adult? Um, yeah, it's, it's something that, like, you think of and you're mindful of. Um, I remember, so obviously school's a really tough time for a lot of people and it's even tough because you obviously feel a bit different and your key part of being at school is wanting to fit in it's mm -hmm. a bit quite fit, like as soon as you look at someone you know they're different so mm -hmm. for me that was that was a bit tough and then i still think it was a bad stereotype for me like especially early high school for aboriginal people and that was something i sort of that weighed on my mind um and at times you know people especially our schools are they're, they're ruthless so yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, it's pretty racism. But yeah, I definitely felt a bit of that, especially at my first high school, um, which was a really multicultural school. So you know, it was probably everyone was getting as bad as each other. But at that age, you're not able to understand that. You can't. I don't think you can really think outside of yourself in your early teens. So, so what with on that racist stereotype, which there definitely is of, of Aboriginal people in Australia. What, how do we break that stereotype? Is it a means of more communication or how do you think we can break down that untrue stereotype? Um, yeah. It's, and generalisation. It's hard. Like, um, I understand it's hard. And one of the bigger issues is, so, I don't know, you take yourself and I, for example, I think your stereotype would be completely, like it just wouldn't exist. Because one, you know me, um, yeah, exactly. I think that makes a huge difference. I think a lot of like it's amazing the amount of people in Australia who say they've never met an Aboriginal person. So mm -hmm. 
if you haven't met someone and there's a stereotype that's unfortunately a burden to our culture, then it's sort of where you're left. So yep. yeah, awareness comes in handy and whatnot, but like that's where coming together is probably more powerful because you know, two people meeting each other um, and understanding where each other come from is going to do more than any article or interview like this could ever do really. Yep. So when, when people don't have the opportunity to meet face to face, like obviously at the moment it's quite hard for COVID, but like, do you think there's an importance for Aboriginal and Indigenous spokespeople? Yeah, definitely. And role models? Oh, absolutely. I look at someone like uh, Stan Grant. I think Stan Grant's one of the most amazing um, role models in Australia at the moment, like for non-Indigenous and Indigenous people. He's, he's phenomenal as a journalist and then also what he does for the Indigenous community to shed light on the pain that exists and the way you can articulate that is amazing. So if you haven't ever listened to some of the stuff he speaks about, you're missing out and it's probably the closest yep. you get to understanding without experiencing is the way he can articulate it. Um, yep. So yeah, they like obviously people being exposed to people makes a huge difference. I think, yeah, if you want to, if you care about it, you go and seek that sort of information. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I said, I think being personable with obviously now it's hard, but being personable with indigenous communities, and there's ways to do it, and there's an amazing array of ways to do it. So it's about really being proactive. If anything. Yeah. So let's t- let's t- do go on the opposite. Other than spokespeople in the media, what are some of those ways that we can uh, integrate more physically, face to face? Um. Yeah. There's there's actually it's an incredible amount of ways you could do it. There's um, like I know education's a big one. The way so that say. I know here in Victoria, um, the, the, the family, the kid who was an ex-headmaster at Trinity Grammar, he's decided there needed to be more of those children getting an education at, uh, at really good private schools. Um, so <laughs> program, but basically he took guys, um, he, he still taught grades, and they get kids who come from remote communities who, whose numeracy and literacy skills might not be the same as you know, your general Victorian student. Um, gets yep. for over like over a year, gets them used to living in the city, um, and then they integrate really well into schools. So that's like at the simple level like that. Scholarships exist in a lot of places. Um, yeah, one's a, a big one. I don't like just sort of see. Um, so I think it's the same way. In trying to get more women into certain industries, it should be the same to you know, our indigenous people. Like they, I think they're yeah, yeah. For sure. And so on education, is there a difference in cultural priorities? Uh, not trying to generalise, but within the Indigenous um, community, which maybe don't prioritise things like capitalism or, you know, accounting and money, like as much as Western, uh, Western educative systems sort of prioritise. Like, for example, in our, in our marking system in high school, if you do an art subjects, subject, it gets marked down 10, like 10 marks, which in my opinion is completely ridiculous. We, our governments are sort of pushing people into following economic-based careers and saying this is what success is, right? Yeah. Whereas is that something that resonates in the Indigenous community? Because it might be a stereotype, but I've always thought that within the Indigenous community, things like art culture, music are, are more prioritised to some extent than things like, you know, becoming like a, a money-hungry lawyer. Mm, yeah. So is there a difficulty in integrating the education? Does there, does there need to be more of a mix Yeah, oh, in what we're teaching? You say, that for, you say that just generally that the education system probably doesn't allow for excellence in all fields. It's sort of really... Yeah. Weird people to work for businesses um yeah create more money for the economy so i guess if you were to take indigenous like i said it's pretty multifaceted the amount of indigenous people and where they come from you know someone uh who lives in, in like a really regional area where you know family and culture and art that's their priority 
well, there's no point going to a private school to do a business, to study business. You know what I mean? Like it's not a, it's just not the, it's not doing you any service. But um, when, I, when I talk about education a lot, it's because the majority, of, like I said, the majority of Indigenous people do live in urban areas. And yeah. to live a sort of sustainable and happy life, I think you need to have education and skills that suit that environment. So, yeah, I'm a big advocate, though. You know, the, I remember growing up, mum used to always say, like, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer, which is silly because they're not skills that really suit who I am as a person. Um, obviously, football is something that's a bit different. Like, so many Indigenous people, we're, all, we're overrepresented in comparison to the, our normal population in football because we have those role models. So, so mm. you know, now I'm working in building because the building really suits my character. Um, and ha- what sort of makes me tick. And I'd like to see kids sort of say, all right, so I don't have to aim for the stars. I just have to aim to be the best in something that I actually care about. Yeah, exactly. It's like not everyone can be an AFL player. <laughs> so to have other avenues as well. It was, I became an AFL player because I was really passionate about it. Like you're never really going to get anywhere in any field without really wanting to be. Yeah, exactly. I think that's interesting what you're saying about um, the education system being flawed just for everyone, like to some extent and just promoting for, for businesses. Um, and I've always thought like when I, I'm living in, in Europe at the moment and when I talk to people about um, the Indigenous community over here, they always say like, do you learn much about the Indigenous community in schools? And like the hard fact is not, is not really, which... I think that like we definitely need to integrate more indigenous studies and cultural activities like in part of schools. Yeah, it is. It's funny when I sort of tell, when I tell people about, so I've been lucky enough to grow up with a fairly rich side of my family and culture from my dad's side. Um, so, you know, traditions um, that have been around for you know, centuries and the reason they're around for centuries is because um, they're practical. Like they make sense. I think people, yeah. I'm blown by this simplistic practicality of a lot of things. I remember literally just this week, I, uh, my, one of my middle names is Chulaguna, which is a totem. Um, so everyone in my family all have a totem. And they ask, well, what, like, why do you have a totem? Like, what's the, what's the reason for it? And I explained that to you, everyone has a totem and as it's your duty to protect whatever your totem is. So if it was a, a type of fish or a bird, you'd, also, you'd always make sure in your, um, in your community it wouldn't ever get overhunted, which when you really break it down, it's just the most simplistic version of sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And same with the... Um, there was a lot of frustration within the Indigenous community about the bushfires, right, earlier this year. Yeah. And how they were preventable. Yeah. The... I remember in, in school, because I, I was lucky, we actually did do a bit of Indigenous history. And um, I didn't know it because my family don't come from a bushfire sort of area. But they they actually talked about seasons. I think it's like almost eight seasons. And then there's a you know back-burning season, which is it's important because if you look at the, the plantation that's in those areas, they're built to withstand fire. So they're obviously meant to be burned. Yeah. So if you burn them, that's safe. Yeah. I'm not doing. Yep. Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's really interesting um, and important what you're saying about how there is this stereotype that the general Aboriginal community are like, you know, living off the land and like in the wild and stuff, whereas the vast majority are in urban areas. And as, as long as we have this ridiculous stereotype then it's going to be much harder to integrate as part of like the the system that we are like or not living in in these big cities yeah well the 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 people that are at most handy people who live in urban areas they obviously their families come like or their distant relatives come from those other places so to travel to halfway across australia (coughs) to a remote community to learn about Indigenous culture doesn't make any sense because you could just speak to someone or get to know someone who has those family ties, who has that, that connection to that land. 
who'll probably explain it to you better than, than those people ever could. He's like, you've yep. got it's almost like a cultural liaison with people who understand both ends of the culture and can help you understand. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, let's talk about language within um, the Aboriginal community. There's, there's many different languages within different Aboriginal communities. Can you talk about, about that and what that sort of, what that sort of means and what that sort of um, represents as, as a culture? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting part of, of Indigenous culture and it's one that's not really well understood. And there's a good reason for that because a lot of stories that are told in Aboriginal um, culture, they're told by mouth or by <clears throat> or dance or art and that's why those things are so prominent in our culture. And the reason, so you would have, you could look up the amount of regions that are the clans that are part of the Kulin nations in Australia you can't look up how those how those languages are broken down because it's not a written language. So compared to like um you know, like in Italy who has like lots of different provinces, the language. Yep. Um and then the the thing that's made the probably been the most destructive part of our culture is the language because if something's not written, um and then when we were put into uh into missions and it was forbidden to be spoken. It doesn't take too long. It probably only takes one generation to lose to lose that culture, that part of your culture, your language. So look at somewhere like um, Tasmania. I don't know as many people who have the have the full language of what like the Palawa people down in Tasmania because it's been that was the most heavily massacred part of yeah. it. So yeah, it's a it is a really interesting part. It's a really lost part of Indigenous culture. I say. Are there efforts to preserve the language? Yeah, and that's yeah, that's a big one. So there's a lot of like um, elders who can speak languages, and that's probably an important thing. As much as I talk about important for us to you know get education and get make the most of the environment that we have access to now, it's also just as important to preserve what's left of the culture. So to learn it from our elders, so it can keep getting passed down. That's where. Um, that's where you've got to play both ends of the, of the bargain, I guess. hundred percent. So uh, you played for Melbourne football club in the AFL for quite some years. Why don't you tell us what, how the AFL helped you and, um, and what, what it meant to you, what football means to you? I think, yeah. Football means a lot to me. I um, probably didn't realize it until I was a little older <coughs> and then speaking to people down at the, when I started playing for a young age, so obviously my father wasn't around and then he passed away. But to be part of football clubs, you're part of somewhere where there's a lot of men. Um, you sort of, and that, that's where I learned a lot of that from. So personally, it was a really important development place for me. And then I think socially um, and culturally in Australia, football is probably the first place that... Uh, that Aboriginal people went to and where they were respected. So back in, mm. back in those days where, you know, racism was rife, that's, yeah, you know, AFL sort of welcomed Indigenous people and that's where those first interactions happened. And, the NFL, and football as a whole has been just so much better than the rest of, rest of Australia in terms of that camaraderie and that coming togetherness. So, yeah, yeah. football should be really proud. I don't think, I think NRL would be the same how far they've come to the rest of the rest of society. Because as a, you know what it's like in Australia, like sport does determine a lot of our cultural understanding or ethics or morality, which is yep. in a sense, but it has produced a lot of good. And what about uh, spokespeople like Adam Goods uh, in the AFL who, who speak up against racism? How important is that? Yeah, well, I think the so he obviously stood up to what was still quite racist society, quite a silently racist society, and I think it made people really uncomfortable when he did that, and it probably still makes people really uncomfortable. But I think anyone who watches the documentary about him like understands the importance of what he did and how much he really sacrificed for the better, like the better good of all of us. <laughs> 
it would have been so easy for him just to, you know, hide away, worry about playing well, um, stay in his box per se. But because he didn't, I think we're all better for it. Right. Let's talk about uh, alcohol and substance abuse within the Indigenous community. Um, it's, it's a pretty terrible um, reality that there's a lot of abuse within the Aboriginal community, especially with alcohol. Why, why do you think that is? I think there's, there's probably a range of reasons. It's probably just on a larger scale, the same reason anyone turns to alcohol, you know, that feeling of worthlessness or, and, um, you know, if your father, you just always saw your father drinking or your mother drinking, you know, you always just follow in that footsteps. <laughs> so, as a whole, there's probably a, a, a generation of people who felt a bit worthless because that's the way they yeah. were. And then because they're in communities, people in their large groups of community, it's just started, it's almost left us with this vicious cycle that's going to be really hard to break out of, unfortunately. That's just... It'd be like any family, but we're just talking about it on a on a large scale. On a family, it's a it's a full race. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about Black Lives Matter, which has been um, a movement which has been huge, uh, predominantly in America, but um, also internationally. What what does Black Lives Matter mean? For you, what is, what, when you think of Black Lives Matter, what do you think of? Um, I think initially I thought it was a great movement. And obviously the foundation of it is, is great and, and it needs to be here and it needs to be heard and it needs to have a voice. But I also think it's probably, and maybe it's just some people taking, taking it too far, but it's almost um, there's some parts of it that aren't asking for, for us to come together. I was like, maybe it's just some of the media that I see in America. Um, in Australia, maybe it's, I thought it was probably completely different. I think I saw the marches in Melbourne. And the amount of non-Indigenous people who were there, I did see you know, something completely different. But I also think it's important to ask the question, what are we asking for? It's, you know, it's one thing to say this isn't right, this isn't just. It's also just as important, if not more important, to, you know, Speak about what it is that you want to change because I like to. I always like if you're going to ask for something or demand something, it's always important to think of who's on the who you're asking it from and how are they going to respond to that. Yeah, if they're not being told what can I do, then it almost just feels like an attack. You're not asking them to join you or give you something, and they, it's sort of like I can imagine some people feel a bit of blame or a bit of attack. So that's where those conversations afterwards need to happen and I'm not sure we really ever got to that stage. I think it's probably torn apart by COVID nineteen, which is unfair. But that's probably the next conversation that needs to happen. What do what do we want as indigenous people? And and then for the people on the other side of the fence to you know ask the question, what can I give you? Yep. Yep. And so Black Lives Matter as a movement has become huge in countries around the world, but is it specific in each country, even as you're talking about these stereotypes of Aboriginal community in, as a whole, is you, we can't do that even within Australia. So the, it, it's a specific case for certain, even small groups. So is it too generalised or is it? Black Lives Matter makes a lot of sense in, in America because you're taking all these people have gone through the exact same <coughs> experience. They've been so often in, in Africa, um, they could have come from any country, but most of the people in, in America who are African-Americans, they could have originated from, you know, war, like countries that are at war at the moment. But what brings them together is their, their blackness. And that's why you know, black lives matter over there. I think it's, it's not fair to, just take that and apply it everywhere because um, in Australia, indig Indigenous lives matter and what, uh, and what they're going through and what we're going through. Um, they're different things. They're different problems. They're different issues. 
and it sort of makes it hard if we're all gelling as, you know, under one umbrella. As for someone who's trying to help, it must get confusing. Like, yeah, quite like we just don't have this. Like, there are similar issues, but they're not the same issues. So yep. I think the best thing we could ever do for ourselves is to take the same principle of Black Lives Matter. Names don't mean anything, but, like don't mean everything, but probably a point where we need to get our own ident- identity to it so we yep. can get our own problems towards it. And I think that should apply to every country that's, that's doing that. Yeah, for sure. Start getting specific about areas that where there's wrongdoings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that so, doesn't mean about other countries, or America specifically in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but yeah, it's also important. Yeah, like you said, to separate it and spe- like get more specific with what are our issues and how do we address them. So, specifically within Australia, what are some of the areas of racism, other than just the general misconceptions or stereotypes uh, of against the indigen- indigenous community? What are some of the examples of areas that we need to focus on? where racism does exist, whether that's micro racism or whether it's straight up harsh racism? Um, I think if you were going to start at a priority, I think the priority is as in life and death has to be the amount of deaths in custody. Um, I can't remember the specific number when people were marching, but I think it was high 300s, close to 400s, maybe even more um, of indigenous people who'd been, killed in custody, so in police custody, and we haven't had a single arrest or charge to any of those. Um, right. Look up a case about um, Tanya Day, who uh, died in police custody, but shouldn't, shouldn't have ever been in police custody. And then the aftermath of that was quite sad. It was maybe a month ago after they did the uh, inquiry into it, for the police to be charged for negligence um, to you know custody that resulted in her death, it was an internal investigation, so it was obviously never going to get the just outcome. Yeah, those are the sort of issues at the pinnacle that we're dealing with, and then obviously you can work your way down from there with the systematic racism, and then you know just the small day to day racism that is out there, but. I think you just start at life and death first and, and work your way back. For sure. Um, so how has, how has COVID um, and Melbourne, for those watching, is the most locked down city in the world? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, but I think it's been almost like six months of lockdown, essentially, with the uh, exception of one month break in August or something. Yeah, so we went into lockdown on the 22nd of March, I think. Yeah. So how has that affected uh, Black Lives Matter in Australia? Um, it's probably, like I said before, like, so it wasn't long after that, that first, like when lockdown first started in March. Um, and then we sort of, we came out of it a bit. So maybe it must have been about June when the, the marches started happening. And when that, that really sort of feeling that something was building and something was going to happen, and it was, um, yeah, it had to be, I think it had to be in Australia, be in Melbourne, be in Sydney, in those major cities where something was really growing. Um, and then for it all sort of just to, it sort of dissipated in a bit. And I think that was a big, a big reason behind that is we were torn apart from each other. You know, we, we spoke about we wanted to come together. We wanted to have these conversations. We wanted to do that. Fortunately, that's been hard over a Zoom com- conversation. You know, it's sort of, yep. yeah, that's probably where COVID hit the hardest. And then there's even, so the, maybe the, the way it was portrayed in media, um, that the second wave came shortly after that. And for a long time, that was blamed on that on the marches, which is obviously brings a negative connotation too. So, you know, at least that, that energy is there and hopefully it come, we can build it up and bring it back um, when we can all come together properly. But yeah, it, it felt like a missed opportunity, if I could say, put it simply, yeah. 
Yeah. What do you think of, there's been cases in America where people have been looting stores. Um, the Amazon headquarters was burnt down um, in, with uh, looters crying for the death of capitalism. And they're doing this under the banner of Black Lives Matter. What, what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, it's obviously, it's not what Black Lives Matter was out to do. I can sort of understand that it got to a point where everyone just wanted to express themselves in some way. And unfortunately, and I can imagine a lot of them would have been teenagers who don't understand how to how to express themselves and their emotions. And they're so upset and so angry that, you know, something that seems public like a business or just seemed like the best way to get back at the system. I mean, really they were probably hurting, you know, their neighbor. Um, yeah. It was just, I think it was just, they wanted justice and they didn't get it initially and they just were red and, you know, the only way they could get a reaction was to, basically burn down the city and then you know some people just take advantage of a situation in the looting sort of sense and they're probably you know left with a new pair of air jordans with a smile on their face unfortunately and do you think that maybe the media took advantage of those of those uh the looting and um similar similar acts to maybe portray the movement in a poor light yeah well you know, what was it like in Australia? What was the media reportage of the protests? Um, how was it represented in the media? It was, at the time, it was, I thought it was represented really well. I didn't see a, a much negative, okay. yet, which, was, which I, was, I was interested to see how it would go. Um, but then, obviously, like I said, when the second wave sort of came, I don't think the mainstream media ever really pointed fish or fingers or really demonised it. But if you were to look at the comments... Um, beneath it, an article that was enough for you to see that there's a lot of people really upset by it or wanted to point their anger. Like I said, the people would point their anger towards looting, point their anger about lockdowns towards that, that march. They needed something to blame. Um, so yeah, there, there was a bit of negative feel about it eventually. Um, so how do we I think these conversations, especially more long form conversations are really important to start talking about um, specific areas of racism or specific areas where, where changes need to be made. How, how do we uh, have more of these conversations? How do we open up more discourse between the indigenous community um, and the white community within Australia? How, how can we go, how can, what efforts can we make to sort of, um, increase education on, uh, and discussion? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. It's a, where do you start really? But I think you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of cultural significant times that people should embrace themselves into. I think NAOC week, if, you're, if you are a normal Australian and someone who's non-Indigenous, go to something on NAOC week, and it's a full celebration week about Indigenous culture. I guarantee you any Indigenous person you know is celebrating during that time. And that should be a really happy way to sort of introduce yourself to Indigenous culture if you don't know much. There's the uh, National Sorry Day. It's a good, good time to ask that question. Why, like, why do we have this? Why, why do yep. we have this? Sorry. Um, Australia Day, obviously, is a quite touchy subject for most Indigenous Australians, it's a time to ask someone, Indigenous or non-Indigenous, because I think a lot of people know why um, it's a touchy subject, is, you know, that's when those conversations are. Like, look for the opportunities to find out information. Yep. And do you think we need to change the date of Australia Day just to change, what obviously, what it represents? It, it just doesn't... Maybe just, talk, maybe just talk about what Australia Day is for our listeners from um, overseas. So... Australia Day is obviously the day that uh, the white settlers from Britain first came to Australia. Um, and then obviously massive people and the genocide of the Indigenous population. And it was probably the start of a really dark time for Indigenous people. 
So that's to be celebrated doesn't make a lot of sense to us. It's like, to put it in simplest terms, it's like having Anzac Day and no one having a moment of silence um, or Remembrance Day and no one having a moment of silence and all being a celebration and people telling you to get over it. Whereas it really should be, okay, that's a day of sorrow. And then you could put it the next day and I guarantee you not many people would be all that fussed about it. And then it could be an inclusive celebration about, you know, where Australia is now. That's where it doesn't. Mm. I think a lot of people just choose to be against it, just to be against it. As in, people get quite defensive, defensive about it with no right to be. Like that's such a good way to put it about Remembrance Day or Anzac Day because that, it is like a massacre, a day of massacre, and yeah. sort of celebrating. And like Australia Day is all about drinking beers and essentially getting drunk. But yeah, that that is a a good point that we should make a day where we both celebrate together yeah. rather than celebrating a, a massacre. Like, yeah, exactly. And, you know, dude, and if that can't get people over the line in terms of just caring about other people outside of them and they just need a selfish approach, you know, you might get two public holidays. So that's enough for you, for you to think that it's worth a worthy cause and go for it. All right, mate. Well, um, was there anything else you wanted to speak about? No, I think we oh, went over everything. It was great. Thanks a lot for um, your time, mate. I appreciate it. I think it was a really good conversation. Thank you. Make sure to follow the Rocky Road Post on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube.